Welcome to Wildcat Country presented by Harris Auction Casino. Eric Cohen and Shane Dale, and yes, men's team is still playing. We are super excited to talk some sweet 16 basketball tonight, Shane, with a first-time guest on the program, Ryan Hansen, the color commentator for Arizona Basketball at McHale Center, is joining us, and we're really excited to get his uh, thoughts on what we saw this weekend. Team looked good, and uh, feeling pretty optimistic. How about you? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it wasn't without some butt clutching, as always, but, um, you know, they they struggled early against Long Beach State. They struggled uh, eh, kind of late, late-ish against Dayton, but, I mean, Dayton's a good team. But I, I don't enjoy it in the moment, but I think going forward, I kind of like that they had to, I don't want to say struggle because it wasn't that big a struggle, but they, they weren't blowouts, you know, and they're, they're reminded that this is the time of year where you have to play your best for 40 minutes and you're not going to skate by. And these guys know that, but I think that they have a little bit of that. They're, they kind of straddle the confidence, arrogance line. It's, it's easy to forget. So I, I kind of like that. They didn't blow out both teams that they were close, even though we didn't enjoy it in the moment. What do you mean they were it, close. They weren't close. James. Cl- well, I said, well, let me, let me clarify. So the, it, the first half Long Beach state gets up by five points. And we're all thinking, is this really going to happen again? Yes, and you know, correct. by four minutes in the second half, it, it, it's okay, but it wasn't like a wire to wire blowout. Okay. And then Dayton, they get up 17. Dayton does its thing and comes back early you know, and cuts it to three in the second half, cuts it to mm-hmm. seven again, late in the game. It really wasn't over until a minute or two left. So they weren't nail biters per se, but we also weren't really comfortable until the second half in both games, especially in the Dayton game, which. But let okay. me ask you, but let me ask you this. Okay. You're, this is Arizona in the tournament. Mm-hmm. We know how this has gone for us since 2003. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've been five elite eights and painful loss after painful loss. Yep. What do you need to see to feel comfortable? They're like, literally for me, I, I don't know if I can get comfortable. No, there's Even no up 15. You saw what happened to Houston. There's the no such thing. No such no, thing. No, no, no. And I don't think that one blowout is, is indicative of what's going to happen next. You know, the UConn uh, winning both their games easily doesn't mean they're going to win the next one. I, I And I think back to uh, was it 2011 when Arizona snuck into the tournament as a 12 seed. They won their first two games which is a great story. Got to the sweet 16 when no one picked them to, to get anywhere that close. Then they get absolutely obliterated by Louisville by 40 points in the sweet 16 Louisville two days later loses and they're out of the tournament. So one game doesn't dictate what's going to happen in the next. And I think the fact that Arizona does have things to clean up while playing well enough and while getting doing enough to, to move on is a good thing going into the next couple of games, hopefully right, at least so, two games. Yeah. So we're going to break this down in a lot more, uh, but let's get into a non-basketball edition of Shane's standouts. Do you want to give us any, do you have anything you were for very us? Specific. Yeah. And I know basketball is a big talker, but I'll, I'll go through these quick, you know, and I want to mention all three starting pitchers for Arizona baseball in their series okay. against Oregon. They lost two out of three, but mm-hmm. the Clark Candiotti, Cam Walty, Jackson Kent, they combined to allow five earned runs in that series. Okay. The hitting just didn't come through until the, the series finale. Uh, they lost the first two games by a, of the series by a run apiece. A uh, big concern going into the season was for Arizona baseball was pitching and the starters shine against Oregon. So at least that's a positive. And then the other one I'll mention, I want to wish the Jim cats the best as they move on to regionals at Fayetteville, Arkansas this week, they had a strong performance at the PAC 12 championships and they earned their fifth straight regionals appearance. So best of luck to those ladies as they head to regionals. That's what I got. All right. I, I, you know what, but people want to hear about, our thoughts on everything that we saw this weekend. And they also want to hear, they listened to last week's show number 200, that we have some awesome prizes to give away. We oh, yeah, will, we, we mention those yeah. in the third segment. We have some winners that have been drawn and we will tell you what you are winning. And those, those people who are lucky enough to win in our third segment, but this is buy or sell, which is presented by our friends at ice shaker, go to ice shaker.com and use promo code wildcat country, capital W capital C get $5 off your first purchase after you purchase that ice shaker, uh, do the post production or post purchase survey Got it. and uh, mention Wildcat Country, and we'll be very, very happy with you. All right, Shane, number one, uh, this buy or sell. Arizona got the cleanest path to at least the Elite Eight that it could have ever reasonably drawn up. To at least the Elite Eight, yeah. I mean, you don't want to overlook Clemson, and we'll get to that, but. I mean, look, if you consider that all the one seeds and two seeds have advanced to this point, then, then sure. And and by the way, I think Clemson was the only underdog in in, um, in terms of uh, betting odds, the only underdog to win this past weekend. I think everyone, all every correct. other that's, round of 32 yep. team that was a favorite, including five seed Gonzaga over four seed Kansas. And, and you know how won. that makes me feel, by the way. I just want to pause your thought here. 
I have always said on this show over the four years that we've done this, I like to see the Blue Bloods. Now, outside of Kentucky, who blew it, we're seeing the best teams in college basketball. We're not seeing these fluky, fluky garbage. And you yeah. know what? I am happy with that. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, this is the opposite of what we saw last year for the for now. For now, you know, only one double digit seed get has gotten this far. All the one seeds, all the two seeds, three of the or two of the three seeds. Um, I don't think and we'll get into this later. I know Cle- I don't think Clemson's going to be as, as easy a win as some fans might think. You certainly can't complain about the draw combined with the location. Okay, you, you think about the other three teams in Arizona's uh, left in Arizona's region. There's you know Arizona's out west. Everyone else is is way out east. Uh, my concern is that even now, I think this team has to propensity to look ahead a little bit. And and knowing that if they get to the Elite Eight, they'll either face Caleb Love's former team or Jaden Bradley's former team again. By the way, uh, Jaden Bradley, Caleb Love, Umar Balo, Keisha Johnson, what do all of their former teams have in common? They're all still left. They're all still here. Go figure. Mm-hmm. So it's just it, it could lead to a lot of interesting storylines. But, um, you know, so my concern is maybe they get smacked in the mouth a little bit coming out of the gate against Clemson because they think, you know, between the fans and that, you know, they were supposed to play Baylor and, you know, that they might get uh, fall behind a little bit early, but that aside, no, you certainly can't complain about uh, about the path that Arizona has in front of it. All right, so Shane, we've got Long Beach State, who is a a team that did not belong in the Big Dance if they didn't win the uh, the Big West tournament. So they they got lucky to play them because they weren't very good. Um, then they got you know Dayton was an okay team, didn't win their conference tournament, made it out of the Atlantic Ten. Uh, and, uh, I think they're, they're a 10, I believe. Yeah. And it just, they, they weren't, they had one really good player, uh, Holmes from Arizona really. Mm-hmm. And, and the, and the kid who shot 50% from three point range. And outside of that, really, there was nobody on the court. That, not, not a lot of depth. No, no. And there wasn't Arizona good players. They had two Arizona good players, maybe even one and a half at that point. Uh, I thought it was a break not to play Nevada. Nevada totally choked away that game to Dayton. I was and ready. I, thought, to ha- I had a tweet ready to go about you know Nevada's going to be a tough matchup, and then uh, that was that was something else. That was something else. Yeah, it cost me some money, but we I don't want to talk did. about that. Uh, yeah, that was not good. Uh, thank you, Nevada. That that started things started out so great for me, and then you know from the betting perspective, anyways. Uh, and then so you look at that, and then Baylor, a team that, and we were texting with Jeff Dean uh, yesterday before the games. And, and we were saying, all right, so Baylor's either going to, you know, shoot really well and play Arizona. We would just assume that, the, you know, Baylor would win. And, you know, it's going to be a, a high scoring game. And if Baylor shoots well, Arizona could be in trouble. Fine. And Clemson, Jeff pointed out, all right, really good zone team. I mean, they they dismantled Baylor. Uh, they, they were that game and, was and Baylor really not a lot close. Of, and Baylor missed a lot of free throws, too. You know, right. Baylor had, I mean, just, they had a, they end, a chance to yeah. tie with a minute less than a minute left. They missed two free throws. They missed two free throws. Right. But outside of that, I mean, Clemson was in control for the Most first 50, 57 minutes. Yeah. I mean, so Arizona's gotten a dream pass. I don't think Clemson's that good. I, if Arizona loses to Clemson, we'll talk about this. I'll, we'll see. Yeah, I, we'll save it for the last. Yeah, go ahead. My, my disappointment level will be off the charts. I'll just yeah. say that. That's uh, just off, off the charts. All right. Let's get to uh, to number two. Uh, we're we're good now, Shane. Whatever happens from here is gravy. The, the Sweet Sixteen is a fitting accomplishment for this team. Buy or sell? You don't really believe that. I know it, but look, I, I'll, you, I'll, I, I'll, I don't. I don't. I'll I'm waiting for it. you to tell I'll me that you believe that. No, I no. Of course not. You know okay, this to, this to me was the minimum expectation for this team, especially the way after the way they opened the season. It's fine to celebrate a return to the Sweet Sixteen. You know, especially after what happened in last year's tournament, you know, we've learned not to take anything for granted as Arizona fans and alum. But to me, all Arizona, all Arizona has done to this point is set the table. It's fully prepared for them between the talent and experience on this team, the friendly location of the West Regional in Los Angeles. Uh, this is Arizona's best chance to get back to the Final Four in a long time. It's been 23 years, and Arizona can't squander this opportunity now. If they play their best and still come up short against if it's if it's Arizona North Carolina in the Elite Eight and they play their best and they come up short because North Carolina is really good too, so be it. But this is the best opportunity Arizona has had back has had to get to the Final Four in in a decade, and I expect this group of players, and I think it's a reasonable expectation, to play their best basketball of the season this week. And anything too less than that, in my opinion, would be a disappointment. All right. The, the fact of the matter is, anybody that's listening to the show, if they don't make the Elite Eight. With this draw, it's a it's a it's a disappointment. You yeah. you cannot sugarcoat it. If they got to the elite eight and played a good game against North Carolina and lost, yeah, we're disappointed. 
but I could say, okay, Arizona's one of the eight best teams in the country. I can get behind that. Yeah. I believe they are better than that. And with the draw, considering the location of the region that they're in, yeah, they have a significant advantage over North Carolina right now, considering fan support. I was reading somewhere today that that said, oh, North Carolina will travel. Listen, this is an Arizona crowd in LA. All the Southern California people are there. A lot of Tucson people are going to be there. Let's not kid ourselves. It's a game you have, you you yeah. you must sweep this weekend. It, yeah, yeah, and in North Carolina, I mean, they traveled well to the Final Four in uh, Glendale a few years ago. I remember that. Um, but yeah. that was the Final Four. Final Four. You know, I I think a lot of it reminds me of kind of like with, speaking of Clemson uh, when they played Ohio State in the uh, the College Football Playoff semifinal in in Glendale. And it was almost all Ohio State fans because I think a lot of Ohio State fans live out here. And a lot of Clemson fans who had been the championship game the year before were like, we're going to save our money. If they get the championship game, we'll go there. I feel like that's what a lot of North Carolina fans might do. I'm sure they'll be well represented because they are a blue blood. They'll have some fans there. But I I, I think back to Arizona UConn in 2011. And I know Arizona lost that game, but that, that sure on TV sounded like a home game for Arizona. And I yeah, suspect yeah. if it comes down to that again this time, they still got to get past Clemson. But if they if it does... I suspect it would have probably a similar feel to it. All right. So I also want to kind of a bonus question here. At least for me, Shane, this is the best I feel, you know, Arizona entering the Sweet 16 since 2017. So 2022 was the last time they were in the Sweet 16. They were playing Houston. They had just come off that overtime win against TCU where they should have lost. We, we really didn't like the matchup. We didn't feel that great about it. 2017, uh, Arizona beat North Dakota. They beat St. Mary's. They were playing to Z- they were playing Xavier, a number yeah. 11 seed, yeah. felt great about it, and then they obviously lost by two. Uh, 2015, they pay- played Xavier again in the Sweet 16. They beat them. Uh, 2014, played San Diego State in the Sweet 16. Uh, it felt pretty good about that. 2013, I mean, they, they had a pretty nice run under-, under Sean Miller of making the Sweet 16. This is as good as I can remember feeling about ma- them going into the second weekend, yeah. like 2017, and, and therefore, as a Xavier team, they should have beaten and uh, this is a team that they should beat. And if they lose to Clemson, uh, I will be speechless. Well, I would be speechless, but I, I agree that it would be a disappointment. This is a game. I mean, Clemson's going to be tougher than I think a lot of fans expect, but it is a game that Arizona absolutely should win with this level of talent. They have this level of experience, the balance they have on, on both the offensive de- and defensive sides of the ball. I'd say they've been better on defense the first two games of the tournament than on offense, which is not a bad thing. I think the offense will come around. And it's it, I'll, the most encouraging thing for me, Eric, was that Arizona – beat a good team without Kylan Boswell playing well. That's the yeah, first I, time all season we've seen that. I If you would have told me before the Dayton game that Kylan Boswell was going to score two points, I would have thought, no, oh, season's over. Um, but they found a way to win without – and that to me is, is as big a development as anything. Yeah, I mean, what, he had one point and he wasn't very good? Um, two free throws yeah, late con- in the game and that was it. Yeah, I, I was concerned. Uh, I mean, it was it was not good, but you're right. That's, that's a great point about Boswell. Uh, number three, Shane, the in-game adjustments that Tommy Lloyd made were reassuring. It's time for – Time for me to apologize for doubting his uh, his in game coaching. Oh yeah, I'll buy that. I think he's always one thing he's done well at Arizona for all throughout his entire time here in the three years he's been here is is in game adjustments, especially with personnel. You know, I think back to his first year at Arizona when he they played a very good UCLA team in Tucson. He took both Matherin and Tubelis off the floor for the last couple of minutes because he thought that was just the best matchup, and it was. It worked, and and I think he's earned the benefit of the doubt there. You know, taking Balo out of the game for late. For long stretches against uh, against Dayton worked out nicely. Um, you know, obviously leaning on Jaden Bradley a lot. He had to. Boswell got in foul trouble, but no, I I think he is, he is. You know, if you agree with Peyton Manning, and maybe it translates to basketball that there's no such thing as halftime adjustments. I maybe that's true, but in terms of personnel adjustments, I think he's been fantastic at that the, the whole three years he's been at Arizona, including in the tournament so far. Yeah, I this is the best coaching that I've seen. I think I what I like is Arizona found solutions to the zone when Long Beach State went there. Uh, maybe that's just the talent differential, but even against Xavier, Xavier was, or it's not Xavier, Dayton was mixing up their defenses. Yeah. They've got one Ohio team, another Ohio You're team. You're mixing up your A-10 team. Too. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, they're now, Xavier's now. In the I, know, East, I know, You know who's I know. counting. Uh, anyways, I I just felt like against Dayton, you know, Boswell's not playing well. Uh, I thought his substitution patterns were pretty darn good. I thought putting Krivas in, and, and yeah. we actually saw a defense, or a dunk from Mo Krivas. I was we shocked. I didn't, I didn't know that he could do that at seven yeah. three. 
Uh, I, I, when's the last time you had saw it, seen a dunk from Mo Krivas? Yeah, he's got a little bit of. I, I, I sometimes I think of him as Mo Waiton. You know, just go up, yeah. go up like a man, dude. And he, he finally did. You know, he's got a lot of talent. I think he's going to be great. He, he. I mean, he fills in for basically. He's just there to fill in minutes for Balo. And if he happens to score, that's that's icing on the cake. So. I like the way Tommy Lloyd has been using his personnel at least these last two games. I mean, obviously, we can question what happened against Oregon and what happened against USC. I mean, it wasn't great. But all right, I guess those two games are forgotten for now. That's that's a previous season, and Arizona's gotten as far as they had previously reached under Tommy Lloyd. Now, we, you got to win this game. I mean, yep. I, I'm going to say this over and over, probably 16 times on this show, got to win this game. And I think everybody listening, there's nobody, if you're listening to this podcast and you're thinking, well, Arizona's a six and a half point favorite. You know, Clemson's a good team. I wouldn't be upset if they lost to Clemson. You're crazy. Like you're crazy. You, yeah. you just this is not a good Clemson's not that good. They 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 played well against New Mexico, who was awful, and Baylor wasn't very good either. Arizona's more talented than the. Yeah. And, and I, I will people. I will I will throw this out. I was going to save this for the last segment, but I'll throw it in now. One thing is Clemson is not going to be intimidated by the the likely hostile environment they're going to feel because uh, there's one team all year that went into uh, Chapel Hill and won, and that was Clemson. They lost at Duke by a point. They won at Alabama earlier in the year. So they are one of the better teams away from home. They're not going to be intimidated. And so I, I think, and I think they're also probably a team where they feel like maybe they don't have a lot to lose because no one expected them to get this far. I think, so that concerns me. Like, as far as like, I feel like Clemson might jump on Arizona out of the gate, like get up like a 10 to two or something like that. Kind of like the Alabama game we saw in Phoenix. Sure. Uh, but so that concerns me a little bit. So in Clemson started the season nine and zero. they were ranked in top 15 at one point. They haven't played like that for most of the season, but they're capable of playing like it in any given game. And we saw that against North Carolina. We saw it against Baylor. So that is something to keep in mind. All right. I mean, that's, I think that, I think that's a fair take, but this is a team that you look at the ACC. All right. They won at North Carolina. I mean, yeah, their road wins, not bad. They won just kind of looking at it now. Uh, they won at North Carolina, which is a great win. They won by four there. Yep. Um, they lost won at a point, Alabama. Lost by a point at Duke. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I they won at Pitt, who, you know, was a decent team for a while there before, you know, kind of fit. I mean, so they, you know, the, the wins are not are not awful. They, they beat UAB by one. UAB uh, won their conference tournament, the A-10 tournament, and and made the, I think they're eight, or, I don't know, I get these conferences confused. Anyways, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's this this Clemson team uh, or they're in the American. I'm sorry. This is the American team. Uh, uh, regardless, uh, this is a team that is not it's not bad, but Arizona is way better. I mean, yeah. and I also want to mention this. Joe San Sanon, I believe, is the name mm -hmm. that Arizona just got as a Tommy Lloyd got him to reclassify from 2025 to 24. And, and now he's coming in next year. I'm impressed. I mean, this is a this is a legit commit of a guy that had been projected in 2025 mock drafts to go in the top 10. I mean, this is a yeah. Ben Matherin type player, six, five wing. Tommy, Tommy's having a good week. It's interesting. Cause this is a kind of a, more of a Sean Miller recruiting class as yeah. opposed to a Tommy Lloyd yeah. where you get maybe a couple of high school guys. And then you had some transfers and some, uh, you know, some international guys. He's going heavy on the the high school, which isn't a bad thing necessarily. I hope that certainly with a the talent, they're going to lose uh, in the off season that he brings in a couple of uh, experienced transfers yeah. to, because uh, you can't, you know, the Kentucky model doesn't work. We've seen it hundred um, percent, but no, he's on a roll right now. And that's, and there's, and that's fantastic. It's um, it, it's interesting to see the class he's put together and we'll see how many open roster spots are going to be at, when all said and done. All right. This is, this is kind of a bonus question you wanted me to throw in here. And I thought it, it's a good yeah. one here, uh, not Arizona related, but bonus question is that GC or bonus buy or sell is that GCU has solidified itself as the second best men's basketball program in the state by yourself. I think so. I mean, I think for a while it was fun to tease about and, and, but I think realistically now, I mean, GCU is the better program between GCU and ASU. They're the best team in, in, in the Phoenix area. I mean, they, they won 30 games. They, they could have easily beaten Alabama. It was a, uh, they you know got away from them late. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's going to be tough to maintain GCU being in the whack and, and, uh, and ASU being uh, in the, you know, going to the, the big 12 now. But I think that, you know, the way that you establish yourself as a mid-major is to get those wins and exposure in March 
And then you have to keep your coach on top of that. And Gonzaga is the only team that's been able to do that as far as a mid major over the last 20 some odd years. So if GCU could do the same thing, then, then they can, they can maintain that level and Arizona and GCU will be known as the two best teams in the state of Arizona indefinitely. If they can swing that. Gosh, it would have been so cool to see GCU uh, beat Alabama and they, they had it. I mean, they just, yeah. they played a poor second half. I mean, that, Missed that a lot of free GCU, throws too. Yeah. yeah, but to beat St. Mary's, that's a that's a hell of a season for GCU. And yeah, I mean, ASU, what have they done? GCU's won more round of 64 tournament game. When's the last time ASU won a, 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 turn, a round of 64 tournament game? Long time. And the game that hasn't been a play in. Yeah, it's been a long time. I, I mean, Shane, I, I'm I'm legitimately trying to look this up. I don't think they uh, have under Hurley, have they? I mean, they they won a, they won a couple of play-in games, and that was it. I think the last time that ASU won a round of sixty-four game was in two thousand nine against Temple. Think about that. Yeah, I mean, oh yeah, it, I, I remember that game. Yeah, yeah, I mean, since since two thousand four, in the last twenty years, ASU has won one round of sixty-four or beyond NCAA tournament game. I mean, that's Amazing. pathetic. Yeah, I mean, that, that, so you got to give GCU a lot of credit. They made the tournament what three times in the last four years now, and they they you know they beat a, a good St. Mary's team who won the WCC regular season and conference titles, tournament titles. Yeah, good for them. Very impressive. Uh, number number four, I guess whatever number we're on here, <laughs> uh, the women's team season. Uh, they listen. They beat Auburn to get into the round of sixty four, and mm. then blew a lead to Syracuse. Nonetheless, should be considered a success. Just making it uh, to the round of sixty four. Buy or sell? Yeah, it depends on your timeline. You know, if we're talking preseason expectations, I think that was the bare minimum. You know, this was a team that looked pretty loaded heading into the season, at least in terms of incoming freshmen. But you had a big injury to one of those freshmen before the season. And then for whatever reason, players leave in the program, which we'd like to get more clarity on in the near future. Hopefully we will. But I no, I am extremely proud of how well the seven-player team, and it is a seven-player team, did to not only keep things together, but get to the tournament and win a game when they got there. So from that perspective, yes, I will, I'll, I'll buy it. Now they had, they had trouble closing games all season and that happened again against Syracuse. They, they let another uh, late lead slip away. They were outscored 13 to three in the last couple of minutes, but I think it's still okay to be proud of, of what this, for lack of a better term, this skeleton crew accomplished when yeah. you consider all the setbacks. Yeah. I, Shane, I couldn't agree with you more. They lost their, their best player, uh, the freshman that was coming. I don't remember her name was out for the season in, in the preseason. Yep. You had Maya Naji leave. You had Kaylin Gilbert leave. Mm-hmm. You had roster tur- turmoil all over the place. Um, yeah, I think Adia did a pretty darn good job. I don't think they belong in the tournament. I said that. Um, but she got them to play. She got the people or she got the girls to play really hard that were still there. And and that that is all you can ask for. They Absolutely. were they were they did not you know, they were going seven deep. You didn't think they were going to make a big run. They're in they're in UConn. They're in Stores, Connecticut. They're not going very far. But they the, to beat Auburn, great, good job, Adia. I, as far as I'm concerned, you did you you, you exceeded my expectations because I didn't think you belonged in the tournament. That's fair. That's a fair point. And and you know, Adia's been on with us a lot of times. We haven't had her on for a while. Hopefully, she'll come on here in the off season and we'll chat and find out what's going on and what the future has the future has in store for her in the uh, in the program. All right. Uh, before we bring on Ryan Hansen, I want to tell you about our newest sponsor, Harris Auction Casino. Harris Auction is the only Valley Casino with Caesars Rewards, the player's card that pays for Vegas and more. In fact, the reward credit credits that you earn with Caesars Rewards can be redeemed for hotel stays, dining, and more at 50 destinations across the country, including Vegas, Lake Tahoe, New Orleans, and dozens of others. Sign up, play, and earn Caesars Rewards only at Harris Auction Casino. One card, 50 destinations to enjoy your perks. Very exciting times. We are very glad to have Harris Auction Casino as our primary sponsor of the 201st and counting episode of Wildcat Country. By the way, just want to point this out, that if Arizona were to win on Thursday night, Shane and I will do a bonus episode of Wildcat Country on Thursday night, just breaking down what we saw, who Arizona's playing, and how we feel going into Saturday. If they lose, yeah, you won't hear from us till next week. But I fully expect to be doing putting out a late night show on Thursday. How about you, Let's Shane? Hope. Let's hope. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully episode 202 will be this week and not next week. Coming up next, Ryan Hansen here on Wildcat Country. What's up, Wildcat Country? Chris Gronkowski here, and I'm at the Ice Shaker Warehouse, the proud sponsor of the Wildcat Country podcast. And I got something new and exciting to show you. We're talking about the 4D printed University of Arizona shaker bottles. 
with the Legacy Championships on it. Check it out now at icesaker.com. All right, Shane, for his first appearance on Wildcat Country, there is no better time than to welcome the color commentator for Arizona men's basketball on radio, Ryan Hansen. Ryan, very glad to have you join uh, Shane and I. So I'm going to start you with a tough question because we don't, we don't, you know, go easy here on Wildcat Country. Uh, they've made these Sweet 16. This is great. Is it Final Four or bust? Or is it okay where they're at now? Or even the Elite Eight where you would say, good season, met expectations. Reggie said, just want to give this one, Reggie a couple weeks ago said Final Four or bust. Do you agree? I agree. It's been too long. It's been too long since the last Final Four. And if you want to consider yourself as a fan or a part of the program that Arizona should be in the conversation as one of the elite programs or I'm not going to say blue blood, modern day blue blood. We're, we're not there yet. We, we have to win multiple titles and get to more final fours to even be in the conversation. But for Arizona fans, I, I really feel like if they lose short of the final four, it's still going to be all oh, what could have or should have happened primarily because of the talent and what we know the ceiling of opportunity is for this team. Ryan, if I want to start by apologizing for not having you on for any of our first 200 episodes. That was a big mistake on Eric's part, and I apologize on his behalf. Uh, but appreciate you joining us on such, on the, such short notice. Uh, compare this team to Tommy Lloyd's first two at Arizona. I mean, two years ago, the talent was certainly there. The experience, maybe not so much. This team, I feel like they've got it all. Talent, experience, everything in its favor. Is this the most complete team Tommy Lloyd has had in his three years in Tucson? Absolutely. I, I think, you know, and really comparing to 22 is probably the best because I think everyone would agree, even comparing to last year is almost not fair to last year's team. This team yeah. is so much better from uh, from top to bottom, from a talent level, a shot making and experience, a leadership. Uh, but really defensively, I think this team is better than 2022. You had individual very good defenders. You had the Pac-12 Defensive Player of the Year, Christian Coloco. Yep. Dalen Terry was an exceptional on-ball defender in his own right. I think Ben Matherin was good, not great um, as a defender. But you had so much to cover up with Kirk Risa and Azulis Tabellis, that as a unit, you could not be termed a really elite level defensive team. When Arizona is locked in this year, I think you could argue this is an elite level defensive team when they're locked in. Yeah, and they're top 10 in both uh, Ken Palm adjusted offense and defense, so the numbers certainly uh, uh, support you on that. Let me ask you about Kylan Boswell, because I feel like most of the season he's been this team's X factor, for lack of a better term. If you had told me before the Dayton game he was going to score two points, I would have thought Arizona was out of the tournament but they found a way to win. Number one, how important is he going forward? And number two, how important do you think it was that Arizona found a way to beat a good team without Kylan Boswell playing his best? To advance in the tournament past the Sweet 16, do you have to have every single player playing at their best? Not necessarily. You guys, I don't want to play, let's go down the history books, but it doesn't. you don't have to go too far to say, wow, Michael Dickerson really didn't have a great Final Four and Arizona still found a way to win the national win the national title without him playing his best or even at his averages. So can Arizona be a team that withstands a down game or two from a couple different players? Absolutely. It's hard to do that at the point guard spot. It's hard to do that with what you need in the NCAA tournament to advance at the guard spot. Uh, I'll dovetail that into your second part of your question. We've all been somewhat waiting for the Jaden Bradley we saw on Saturday. It was hyped. It was advertised as this is who he's going to become. Some of us thought it might be next year that he would be this guy. Early on, it was effort, energy, quick hands, elite level defense, you know, elite level hands. But would he be able to score enough? Could he be a threat? Could he knock down a perimeter jump shot? All three of those questions were answered in the Dayton game. If you look at him knocking down a three, he got to the free throw line. And that at three and a half minutes, other than Caleb Love uh, and KJ Lewis, I don't think there's anybody else on the team that could pull off that move. And you need that type of guard play uh, in the NCAA tournament. So huge that Jaden Bradley has shown up on the scene. You're going to see equal minutes at worst, I think, for those two, if not more minutes for Jaden Bradley than than Kylan Boswell. And depending on the game, and you you guys have talk, talked about this, I watched your shows. You know early on if it's a Kylan Boswell game. It was early on in Long Beach State, and you're like, this is a Kylan game. You can see it. And I, unfortunately, in the Dayton game, you just kind of felt it. It just wasn't there for him. And he's still growing. 
I think he's probably going to continue to start. Uh, and you just hope that when Arizona, if Arizona needs Kylan Boswell, it's he's there. How do you feel about the matchup against Clemson? You know, we were texting with a guy that you know quite well, Jeff Dean, uh, before the game sure. yesterday. And we said, well, what do you think here? And he said, well, Baylor is a team that can get hot and, they, you know, kind of like an Alabama type where they can score 90 points and whatnot. Clemson's a zone team. What can you tell us about Arizona against that matchup? Are you concerned about that Arizona against the zone once again? You know, I, I have the same sense of who do I want to play when you looked at those teams? And the easy answer would be, well, Baylor plays the style that we play, the pace of play. We're more comfortable. That suits us better. But I think they're their ceiling, their, when they're playing well, they're really difficult to defeat when they are scoring like they can score. And their defense is, is still pretty good, uh, but they're undisciplined. And I think that's what got them against Clemson was just bad shot taking, a uh, little hero basketball. When I look at Clemson, they are very efficient on both ends of the floor. Uh, I don't want to say Arizona's uh, dispelled the rumors and the issues of the zone, but they're definitely better than they've been. Do they have to score over the top? Yeah, they probably need to score, hit the hit the three a little bit. But they, I think they've learned and gotten better at, at beating zone predominant level teams. I don't see elite level athleticism uh, on Clemson. So that to me is, is in Arizona's favor. Uh, I see bigs that are mobile. I see bigs that shoot threes. So Arizona is going to have to account for that. I could see Joe Girard and PJ Hall in pick and roll series. And how does Arizona defend that with Balo traditionally playing drop coverage? Because physically, that's the best thing for him. You have to, you know, take into account his personality and what he can do or not do. But then, what did Joe Girard and PJ Hall? You got a pick and pop opportunity. And so, will we see small ball? Will we see chess match from from Tommy? And I loved the Dayton game because. I think all of us have been waiting for the small ball lineup to be used more than just sprinkled in sparingly. The next question that I have for you about Umar Balo. I think Balo is a key against PJ Hall on, on Thursday night. So Hall is the leading scorer for Clemson, 18 and a half points a game. But in his two tournament games, he's only played 19 minutes in each and gotten into foul trouble again against New Mexico and against Baylor. Fouled out against Baylor actually in 19 minutes. Is it key for Arizona to get Hall in foul trouble with Balo kind of I mean, Balo's got 25 pounds or more on him. Should Arizona immediately go down in the post, get fall, Hall in foul trouble, and then they should be in control against Clemson? Is that a viable strategy in your opinion? I think it absolutely is the strategy every night, regardless of who Arizona plays, is to feed Balo early, put pressure on the defense, try to get the bigs on the other team in foul trouble, or get super high percentage shots if they're not going to foul you. So I think that feeds into what Arizona's inside out DNA is all about. And now that we've seen the evidence that the opponent could be susceptible to fouling, it gives you even more cause to say, get Balo the basketball. So we should see a lot of early offense uh, to start the game for the Wildcats looking for Umar Balo. And he does have an advantage there. And so while some of his weaknesses defensively could be exposed with mobile bigs, they're going to have to contend with him in the low block. Yeah, Ryan, I, neither of Arizona's games were nail biters, you know, going getting into the Sweet 16, but they weren't, I mean, they got the early scare, you want to call it that, against Long Beach State, and then Dayton did push them. Uh, you know, they were down 17 in the first half. Dayton came all the way back, cut it to three in the second half. The fact that Arizona didn't win those games as comfortably as they might have liked, and they maybe, you know, they, they got they got punched in the mouth a little bit here and there. Do you think that's something that might help them going into the to the next round, just you know, so that complacency doesn't tempt it to be to, to set to set in there? I couldn't agree more with you, Shane. I think what we've seen from this Arizona team is when life gets easy, they kind of let up off the gas pedal. And I would rather have them have to work for a win and it still be, as you mentioned, relatively comfortable. Uh, you know, last three minutes, the game was not really in doubt against Dayton. It was definitely not in doubt against Long Beach State. But I liked that they had to work for it, yeah. especially in the first round. I, you know, some people were like, I want to blow them out. We need to be winning by 40. And that'll make me feel like Arizona basketball is ready for a run. The psychology of college kids and what we've seen them this year be able to stay in the moment, stay consistent or lack thereof led me to believe that I liked that they had to work for it a little bit. But at the same time, last three minutes, the three of us, our fingernails didn't get any shorter in the last three minutes. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And my last question for you is, 
and we appreciate again you, you joining us and you know you had, you're headed out of town here pretty quick which is a good thing uh but the Tommy Lloyd's growth in uh, in this three years as head coach I mean he obviously had a ton of experience at Gonzaga but I feel like nothing replaces being the head coach of a program do you think that Tommy Lloyd is more prepared now than maybe he was in year one for this moment I mean I know it's about the players but to, to guide the team to have him ready to make the, the adjustments he needs to make in game do you think he's more prepared now than he was maybe two years ago uh, no doubt are you guys better on episode 200 than you were episode one hope so uh, you know I don't know about you, Shane. I think Eric <laughs> might still be as bad as he yeah, always. No, just exactly that. right. Yeah, exactly right, Ryan. Right. Someone either. said it. Uh, but absolutely, and there is a difference. Uh, that 18 inches uh, of moving over from the associate head coach and Tommy. Let's not fool ourselves. Was very involved at Gonzaga. Was very instrumental in what they did offensively with X's and O's. Not just the personnel and the European recruiting. He was heavily involved, so he was prepared for the head job. But was he experienced enough to make the decisions in the moment that you have to make? You can prep your team. You can have great practices. They're ready to go. You develop the players. But you know there are moves in the game that you have to make because what's going to happen? The other coach is doing the same thing. And there were changes in that Dayton game and how they were covering us. We had to make some changes, going small. How they they just kept putting us in ball screen action over and over. Kobe Brea and Deron Holmes made us do something. So what did you have to do? You had to make a change. And would he have been able to make that change? Yeah, he could have two years ago, but did he? In that moment, did he make the right calls enough? And, and I think he was great two years ago. I think he was great last year. Uh, but I think he's learned a lot over the last couple of years. And I think he's ready for the moment. I think he had a chip on his shoulder too. I felt an edge about Tommy around the team. He was still Tommy. Don't get me wrong. He's still a player's coach. He's still loose. He's, you know, what does he say? Paycheck to paycheck, long neck to long neck, right? That's how he lives his day. But there was an edge. I, I think he was ready and knew like, we have an opportunity to do something here. And he was, he was lit and he was ready to go. All right, two more for you, Ryan. I know I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We have a game to play on Thursday night, but assuming Arizona were to pull off the victory as a six and a half point favorite, because yes, they are a sizable favorite, which team would you like to see them play mm. from a matchup standpoint, North Carolina or Alabama, who we already saw earlier this year? Super great question, because it is, it's not an easy answer. Uh, part of me, I love the matchup with Carolina, right? Up and down tempo, but not chaotic. I think personnel-wise, we match up pretty well. I kind of like the battles there. And are you one that wants the Caleb Love versus North Carolina narrative? I think Caleb Love might actually be perfectly wired for this. Usually, you don't want that. Players play too hard. They play too fast. They're over their skis. I think Caleb might actually be the one guy who's wired to, to take this narrative. The other narrative I, I will say, which is leading me to say I'd almost rather play Carolina for this fact. We beat Alabama on December 20th. That's never fun to try to beat a team twice that's a really good team. And Alabama did not play their best. We didn't play our best either, but let's get real. They were, what, 8 of 30 from the three-point line? Just a lot of open threes in the a game. Now. And a, a lot, lot of open threes, yeah. right? It wasn't contested threes. It was like, woo Glad Grant Nelson missed that one. Grad Marcus Spears missed that one. I, I kind of feel like there is would be more of an edge when we're talking about edge for Alabama for that revenge game. And man, we played really bad and lost a relatively close game. It was not completely in doubt for the whole game. That bothers me. And there's too many times in Arizona basketball history with that revenge or second game around uh, I guess I'm having flashbacks to 2003 Kansas. Uh, I loved winning in Fog Allen. I was there. It was one of the greatest experiences I ever had on the radio and near the bench. I'd trade that win in Fog Allen for the Elite Eight loss in the Honda Center 10 times over. I have a feeling based on his predictions uh, before the tournament that one Shane Dale will agree with you. Now, I really don't want to get ahead of myself too far, but you are the president of Bon Voyage Travel. Which, Correct. as I as I understand, puts together packages for big events. So, when it comes to the Final Four, how in case Arizona were to get there, how can people contact you and and kind of explain what you can do for them? You bet. We're the official travel partner for Arizona Athletics, so all these big opportunities, we're your place to go to. So this weekend, you're going to want to go to our website, bvtravel.com. 
We'll have all the information there and we will have, obviously you don't need air most likely, but you guys may have some viewers that don't live in the Tucson or Phoenix area that might need air help, but we, it's really all about the land package. So it's headquarters, hotels, transfers to the games, game tickets. So you may have listeners that don't have the season tickets and don't have access to, to the final four allotment. So we will have travel packages, not just, you can't just buy the tickets straight out, right? We're a travel agency. So you'd have to buy the whole thing, but why wouldn't you want to be uh, in the final four fandom from Friday to Tuesday and just soak it all up. So we're, we're a place that, that you should take a look at this weekend. BVTravel.com. I think that's going to be hopefully a very important website for many of us uh, going forward. Ryan, great to have you on episode number 201. And I guarantee you that we're going to have you on before episode 250 again. So thanks again for joining Shane and I. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Discover more play for all at Harris Ock Chin Casino. Hi, folks. Here are your drinks. Where having fun means racking up reward credits with the Caesars Rewards Loyalty Program that can be redeemed for food, free play, hotel stays, and more. Not only here in the city of Maricopa, but also at more than 50 Caesars properties coast to coast. From Harris, Las Vegas, the Caesars Palace in Atlantic City. What are you waiting for? Play for all at Harris Ock Chin Casino, the official sponsor of play. Great to catch up with Ryan, his first appearance on Wildcat Country, so glad to have him on the program. All right, Shane, last week for our 200th episode, we were giving away prizes. We had, an Harris, we had a Harris Auction Casino prize pack with a one-night hotel stay and a couple of uh, a dinner $200 certificate and then a breakfast certificate. Uh, this will all be mailed uh, to our winner, and then we have a couple of ice shakers, and you randomly drew the winners, and please tell us who they are. So I did draw the winners. I recorded the drawing. So everyone knows it's in the up and up. And I will I will post that separately on the Wildcat Country uh, uh, Twitter X account. Um, but yeah, we had a, a lot of entries. Thanks so much for everyone who has subscribed and submitted a comment last week. Uh, and thanks to everyone who didn't fast forward just to this point. Uh, hopefully you go back and listen to the rest of the show if you did. I get it. Um, but our after the drawing, our winner of uh, the Harris uh, package, the the stay and the uh, and the food, uh, gift certificates is Nathaniel Miller 2606. Nathaniel Miller 2606. And then the winners of our ice shaker bottles are Michelle Lewis RI6BM. Michelle Lewis RI6BM. And Brad Carlion 9456. Brad C A R L Y O N 9456. So, what congrats to the winners. Email me your contact info, your address, uh, and it probably you think they need a phone number as well, or just an address. If it's, just need an address. Just an address. Uh, how can they? How can they email you? Address. Send me. Send it to Arizona Shane at gmail.com. I know we have a Wildcat Country account, but just send it to me. Uh, Arizona Shane at gmail.com. We'll make sure you get hooked up with your prizes. And if if you miss that, and you're one of the winners, uh, put your name in the comments. It is not uh, for those of you who know uh, Michelle that I am friends with. It is not her. So it is a <laughs> random Michelle Lewis. So congratulations and thanks for listening to Wildcat Country. All right, Shane, it's time for picks. Uh, yeah. We're gonna go down region by region. All I want is just a winner. If you want to give a sentence, great. Um, mm -hmm. But we're gonna we're gonna pick the winner of each game. So let's start in the South. Houston got lucky in a way. Against yeah. Texas A&M, they survived a big comeback. Houston or Duke? Uh, I had Duke and Marquette. I know. I'm sorry. I'm I'm, I'm jumping fine, the gun. Do, yeah. I had Duke. I had Duke and Marquette in the Elite Eight, and they're still both there, amazingly. So I'm going to stick with both of them. Houston shows they can be beat. Their defense is maybe a little suspect, uh, and so I'm I'm going to go with the Dukies as much as I don't want to see them uh, advance. And I'm going to take Marquette. I think NC State's a uh, little uh, Cinderella run ends. And who do you like in the regional final? I have got Marquette. I had Marquette before the tournament. I and Marquette, they've looked shaky, I know, but they got a scare, maybe the wake up call. They're an inconsistent team, but when they play well, they can beat anyone in the country. So I will go with Marquette over Duke in the Elite Eight. All right. So I was going uh, for this region. I originally picked Houston. I thought they would go to the national championship game. I er, earlier today was going to rule them out. And then I thought about it. I'm like, you know what? They, I think they learned from having that scare. I think mm -hmm. they're going to come back and they're going to play much better defense than they did against AM. Yeah. And and beat Duke. I think Marquette beats a, an upstart NC State team. And I think Houston takes care of Marquette fairly easily to advance to the Final Four. So we have a difference there. Now, on to the Midwest. Purdue and Gonzaga. Shane, give us that. And then Tennessee and Creighton. I've got Purdue and Tennessee advancing. I mean, Tennessee, uh, I 
in Purdue and Tennessee, I both had as well going this far. I mean, I had a lot of chalk, so it's not a big surprise. And I've got uh, in classic, uh, you call them per don't fashion. I have got Tennessee with the upset over Purdue in the elite eight. And I got the Vols going to the final four. Okay. I actually agree with all of those picks. I'm going Purdue and Tennessee as well. I picked Creighton to go to the final four originally, but that game against Oregon was super scary to me. Mm. And I'm going to, uh, I, I just, in Tennessee You're less stubborn than I am because I'm just going sticking with my picks, whether no, I, I you know, I, I, I'm not afraid to change. I think Tennessee beats Creighton. And if, if not, then great. Then my first bracket is doing great. Uh, but I'm going, I, I will not pick Purdue to go to the final four. And if they do, then I lose everything. Okay, cool. Uh, UConn, uh, San Diego state, Iowa state, Illinois. I think, that the the later matchup, this Iowa State Illinois game is really intriguing. I think yeah. U, UConn in a rematch of last year's national championship game is going to blow away San Diego State. But Shane, I like Illinois uh, to beat Iowa State. I think they're going to outscore them, uh, and so I'm going UConn obviously to beat Illinois fairly easily to advance out of the East. How about you? I've I've got uh, same except I've got UConn over Iowa State. UConn was not my original pick. I uh, shamefully yeah, had, had Auburn going to the mm-hmm. national championship game. Whoopsies, they lost to, uh, you know, our Ivy League school does me in again. Um, but so now I'm revising that one. I'm going to take UConn over Iowa State. Okay, now I want to go game by game here. Okay. North Carolina and Alabama, it's the late game on Thursday. Who wins? I am, be- like I said, I'm being stubborn. I'm sticking with Alabama. Um, I think North Carolina is a better team. I think Alabama can get hot, get crazy hot at times. And I think they'll find a way to to win. I think North Carolina sleepwalked a little bit through those first two games, which isn't a bad thing. They've got a lot of experience, but for just whatever reason, I'm just feeling like, like Bama is going to get past them. That was my pick before the tournament. And I'm going to stick with it. Uh, RJ Davis, Armando Baycott too much. Uh, I think UNC wins this game going away against an Alabama team. As you said, Shane, that is overly streaky. Now, Arizona against Clemson. I'll make the first pick in this one. Okay. I'm going Wildcats in the neighborhood of 82 to 68. Arizona by 14. I think they pull away late. I think it's a little close. We're a little uncomfortable. And I think down the stretch, Arizona, Caleb Love finds that rhythm and takes care of business and they wear down Clemson. I really love the way that Arizona's defense played, uh, especially against Dayton for the majority of that game. So I think they take care of business. Arizona by 14. How about you? All right. So, uh, you know, Clemson and Dayton have some similarities. Actually, the, I think the team most comparable would be Colorado. You just look at Ken Palm and adjusted offense and defense and tempo. But Clemson and Dayton are kind of similar. They both have a dominant big man who can space the floor, make outside shots. They play a pretty slow tempo, not a ton of depth. Uh, Clemson has that zone defense that Arizona hasn't been able to handle well for a good chunk of the season. Best way to bust the zone is to hit three. So if Arizona can hit some outside shots early, that could open things up a bit and maybe it gets ugly. But uh, I think it's going to be close. Ultimately, I think Arizona's depth and experience will help them get past Clemson. I think it's going to be closer than we'd like. Uh, I'll take them to win by, a couple, uh, I'll say six points. So I guess not quite, it spreads six and a half. Ooh, so I guess not yeah. quite to cover. It's going to be, you know, uh, you know, we're going to need the Tums. We're going to we're clenching the butts. It's just the way it's going to be this time of year. I think Arizona wins, but I'm not, not as comfortably as I think you do. Okay. And now uh, if we both have Arizona winning, you mm-hmm. have Arizona against Alabama. So yeah. go ahead in the Jaden Bradley game. Why don't you give us your pick? I And I told you this last week, Gary. I just ingrained in my memory is all those open threes that, that Alabama missed against Arizona and Phoenix. And I don't think, I think I they could it. get this far. That plus, I just feel like Greg Burns is going to keep finding ways to tor- torment us forever. So my pick before the Elite Eight, I feel a little bit better about Arizona now. But like I said, I'm being stubborn. I'm going to stick with Alabama over Arizona in the Elite Eight. Now, if Arizona plays Alabama, I would expect them to win. If it's North Carolina, I don't necessarily. But for whatever reason, I am just thinking Bama is going to get there and going to outlast Arizona somehow, some way. I, Shane, this feels like it's time. I'm not saying this is the most talented Arizona roster that they've ever had, but sometimes things just happen to align right. And I'm not saying a national championship is coming because mm-hmm. UConn looks incredibly dominant. Yeah, And we can we can debate that game Thursday night if Arizona beats Clemson and Saturday night if Arizona beats North Carolina or Alabama. But you know what? It just feels to me that this is our time. But it does. no one said it had to be easy. So I will take for my prediction, Arizona 79, uh, North Carolina 76. Caleb Love in his revenge game against his old team, hits a late three-pointer to give Arizona the lead, and they hold on, surviving a few last-second attempts from North Carolina to tie 
and the Wildcats advanced. To the is final. it really a revenge game? I mean, Caleb Love after the Duke game said he was a Tar Heel for life. I mean, is it really? I mean, a it's it's, it's not all right, the revenge game. Is playing his old. His I'm old. sure he's going to look at it that way and charge himself up like Michael Jordan did against everyone. He you know, he finds a reason to hate them, but I don't really feel like it's a revenge game for him necessarily. I it it's time, Shane. It's time we start talking about a Final Four. It has been 23 years yep. since we've done it, yep. and this is it's it's going to happen. But let's start on Thursday, one game at a time. If they win, Shane and I will put something out, just a, a quick show, one segment show. That we'll put out, uh, or one or two segments or something like that, that we'll put yes, out on, on Thursday night. Um, that will break it down. Let us hope this is our this is our time. We've been waiting for this. And listen, uh, one final thought here: Has any school had a more charmed life outside of winning? You know, Michigan winning a national championship in football. And what we've seen from Arizona football and basketball. And that's the last thing I'm going to say is that my little, I guess you call it a superstition. I feel like we can't have a lot of nice things at once. The football team had a great season. Can the men's basketball team really do even better than that? I feel like we're just not allowed to have enough nice things at once. And that's stuck in the back of my head too. Does it make sense? Of course not. But I'm a fan first and an analyst media guy second. It's just and how that's I'm... how we close the show with Shane's negativity. Absolutely. I'm not, he- I'm not here for it. Anyways. All right. Uh, thanks to Ryan Hansen for joining us. It's been an awesome show. Show number 201 of Wildcat Country presented by Harris Auction Casino. For Shane Dale, I'm Eric Cohen. Thanks for listening. And especially this week, as always. Thank you.